we got to hear about Jacqueline Winston uh, a little bit this morning, and I wanted to uh, ask each of our panelists maybe just to talk for a couple minutes about uh, what brings them here today and then what they're so excited about talking about. And Laura, maybe we could start with you. Oh, gosh. Okay. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, very grateful to be here. Thank yeah. you so much, and thank you to the uh, Institute and the Library. Um, Oh, gosh, I'm here today. I, this is such an important issue to talk about. Um, having worked in the publishing industry in various ways, so Children's Book Press, which I'm sure most of you will know about, um, as a nonprofit publisher that was based in the Bay Area, then Orchard Books as a more kind of New York based but no longer in existence publisher, and then Lee and Lowe, um, an independent multicultural publisher. Um, I saw a lot kind of from the production side, the creation of books, especially around uh, representing diversity in children's books. Um, and I think it's so important that we think about how the books are produced and the filters and you know some of what Jacqueline was talking about in her talk, um, that it's not just what we see, um, but how these stories are told, who's telling them, and what, what the publishers are doing, what they look like. Um, so I guess that's something that I'm interested in us looking at more and how, um, you know, Meredith talked in the beginning about thinking about privilege and institutions and how dialogue and conversation happens. And I think looking at the ways that books are produced is really important. For me, a lot of my hope and interest is actually in the kind of alternative production that's happening. Aya doing it. You know, there are other people here, Janine from Blood Orange Press, Zeta, Elliot, Maya Gonzalez, lots of people who I think are starting to create these sort of different ways of thinking about telling stories and whose stories are being told. So I guess that's a piece I'd really love to talk more about. Hmm. Thanks. Um, hi. Oh. Hi everyone. <laughs> um, I'm. I'm. Thank you very much, Meredith, uh, for inviting me to be here. I'm very excited to talk to you guys today about this issue, which is has become a, a really major part of my career, which I did not expect actually. Um, but I think that because I came out of working in the LGBT media, I had I had already um, I had become accustomed to writing critically about issues in the media, especially regarding representation of minorities. Uh, specifically, in my case, um, when I worked at AfterEllen.com, which is a, a big website, it's kind of like Entertainment Weekly for lesbians. I mean, we were constantly talking about representation. So that, that seemed to be a natural outgrowth uh, for me to doing this, um, to talking about that in YA fiction, because my books are all about uh, queer girls. And um, so, for me, I'm excited to hear what questions uh, Nina and all of you have uh, with diversity in YA. Um, I've been talking about this stuff for a long time, so <laughs> you know I'm always happy to um, discuss these issues, and I look forward to hearing our conversation. Um, I'm incredibly honored to be here with such a, in such stellar company here on the panel in particular. Um, and I'll just uh, take a moment to tell my children's book writer creation story. Um, back in 2013, I was trying to sell this commercial adult novel and um, it was driving me nuts. And uh, my daughter at the time was three and she was just becoming aware of racial differences. And you know, you talked about mirrors, you know, mirrors and windows. I just felt so, such an urgent sense as she was becoming aware of race and images and magazine covers and what was around to have as many mirrors as possible. Um, so I, you know, I'm a DIY type girl. When I was a kid, my mom used to color in the children in books with a magic marker. She would color them brown and use one to give them an afro, uh, the black marker. And so I just felt like I should seize control of the visuals and there was more technology available. So I just made this little mix book with pictures out of my iPhone of my daughter and our friends and our family and I made the book and you know, we were, thank you, we were reading a lot of Dr. Seuss at the time, so I made a little text, puffy here, puffy there, yay, I love my puffy hair. So that, you know, there were like five lines in the book, she was three, it went well, um, and I, 
<laughs> oh, and I put celebrities in there like Aretha Franklin and the Jackson Five. Like I had no right to use their images, but it was just for us. I wasn't selling it. So, but then friends saw the book. They were like, oh my God, I love this book. We need a copy of this book. You know, and so suddenly it became like, oh, there's actually a need, right? There's a need for this. And um, I was learning as I was trying to get an agent that it was not so easy to publish a book. Um, and I was coming from a decade of being an independent artist, a slam poet, a hip hop theater artist, a spoken word artist touring around. And if I wanted to make a book, I went to the copy place and I made it and I was touring and people wanted it and I sold it and the industry was like so difficult to get into. So I was like, I'm not making a book. I don't want to make a book um, and I don't have time. Uh, because I'm a working artist mom, but that year, 2013, there were all of these reports of attacks on black girls for their hair, right? Girls getting expelled from school for wearing dreadlocks, girls getting thrown out of school for wearing Afro puffs, Afro puffs being banned at a school, I believe, in Ohio. Like, it was just, it was constant. And like, the third one, I was like, fine, I'll do the book. Like, I have to do this book. Um, and I just put out on the internet a call for photographs. You know, I put it on the My Brown Baby blog and my blog and sent it out and tweeted it out, like, send me your photographs. And people from all over the world sent photographs of people with puffy hair and families with puffy hair. It was like black people, Jewish people, Asian people, <laughs> Latino people, like people from all over with puffy hair and a lot of children. And it was amazing. And I went through them and I, I made a book. And I self-published it, um, and I, um, and it was amazing to be able to then send the book to the people who had sent me pictures. You know, I got their little permissions and didn't use celebrities off the internet, and um, <laughs> and you know, and then went around with my daughter reading our book. Mm. You know, we read it at the Oakland Public Library and we read it to her class, and um, so it was really about making that mirror. You know, making the mirror and then including people so that it was a literal mirror. Like the technology today meant that children could have a literal mirror of themselves in a book of people who looked like them. Um, and, you know, and then, and I was like, oh, good, Whew, that's done. And uh, because when you self publish with some of these self publishing folks, like they'd print it on demand, you really don't have to pay attention at all, which was good. And I went on and did manage to get a book deal for my um, grown up book. But the thing that I'll, I just would speak to that so many of us have experienced is this incredible disorientation between, oh, and there's my local librarian. Hi. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the things that I can speak to is this incredible disorientation that we experience as authors that when we go around reading our work or even talking about our work, people are like, oh, I want that book, I need that book. And yet then when we interact with the industry, the industry is like, what? I don't, who's going to read that? I I don't really know, you know. So that that crazy um, that crazy in between land that we live in, you know, wondering, well, you know, do I am I wrong? Maybe I maybe I just know the ten people who want this book, but no, indeed, there is a greater demand, and it's also an interesting time as some industries are figuring that out, and then what does that look like, and who has access? Anyway, that's mm. those are some of the thoughts on my mind. Thank you, and I am gonna move myself because I realize I'm standing behind those guys. That's not nice. <laughs> um, and as I get us started today, um, I, just to kind of set this up, the you know the the discussion of diversity in children's books is not a new discussion at all, and you'll see a lot of people point back to. Nancy Larrick's 1963 article in the Saturday Review, The All-White World of Children's Books. That's now a landmark discussion that we point back to, but I'm sure that was not the beginning of it either. Um, I, you know, I became a librarian in the mid-90s, and it was old news then. And Jacqueline Woodson and Rita Williams Garcia were publishing their first novels. Um, I was reading Redeen Sims Bishop. Smoky Night won a Caldecott. Um, and the Pora Belpre Award was initiated. And then somehow in my experience, this discussion kind of fell apart. Um, we, uh, I remember uh, us talking about um, racial stereotypes in Newbery winners like that are excellent books, 
like <laughs> Maniac McGee and Walk Two Moons. Mm -hmm. And there was a backlash against what was called political correctness, mm -hmm. and then it became unfashionable mm -hmm. to talk about this. Um, and we were somehow past it. Um, I, speaking of privilege, I had the privilege to write the cover story for a school library journal following the media award announcements. Um, and um, in that article that came out in the March issue, I, I claim that we haven't publicly tackled white privilege in standards for children's literature. And some people said to me on the side, um, yeah, we have been talking about it, but I don't think we are, uh, I don't believe that the status quo uh, children's world, uh, children's literature world has accepted yet that privilege plays in how we review, select, and award books. And I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about that today. It, Jacqueline alluded to um, the way that social media has really um, put things in our face. And I think that that, the, uh, we have to have those discussions now. Um, I think the discussions are happening in the world at large, but we haven't yet uh, had those discussions within the world of children's literature criticism. Um, privilege is not just the intellectual exercise that we are going to treat it today. It really is a life and death issue for many people. Um, and I believe that all of us who are here do the work that we do with young people's books because we want to give them tools to make their lives better. If that is true, then we have some very hard work to do, individually and together, uh, to acknowledge the power that privilege plays in the creation, publication, promotion, selection, and awarding of books for young people. Each of us comes here with a different level of familiarity, understanding, and comfort with this discussion. Um, and it's a little bit hard to know where to jump in, and we may grind our gears a little bit today. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to tell you about the, what I've been coming to understand about myself over the last year. Um, I've always known that children's literature and librarianship is overwhelmingly white and female. Uh, I know that it's important to have diversity among our ranks, more of it. Um, and that we have to make room to bring more perspectives to the table. I always have known that it's important for those of us who are white or come from other places of privilege to keep an open mind, recognize our biases, um, and to let that be at play. But it's only recently that I've really begun to understand how, uh, how keeping an open mind becomes a problem in itself if we believe we're being open-minded and that becomes a barrier. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I believe in standards for quality children's literature because I believe that children deserve the best writing that speaks to them as people first, not first as the children their parents want them to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we talk about these standards as if they exist or were born out of nothing. And here I'm going to ask you guys to do a mental exercise. I was going to figure out how to do this uh, on the computer, but we're going to do this truly virtually. Um, and you're just going to think of things. You're not going to share anything. But um, you uh, welcome members of the Newberry Committee. You're, we're uh, so excited to have you guys all here today. And um, we have a very important job in front of us. And before we get started selecting the most important books for the Newberry, um, I want you all to think in your mind of your favorite Newberry book from when you were a child. Okay, now that you have that book in your mind, think about the audience and pretend that we're the Newberry Committee and we're each sharing our titles. And just imagine the titles that are being shared in the room. And now think of that group of titles and who are the protagonists in these books. Um, so that, that's our canon, and you go through the year doing the work uh, that you do to be as open-minded as possible, bringing new, looking at books in different ways for the Newberry, but at the end of the year, you're sitting there with a ballot, you're gonna vote for your first, second, and third most favorite book, which book most deserves that Newberry medal. And you're gonna think back to the titles uh, that have won the Newberry in the past. And as soon as we do that, we've started um, closing the door a little 
Um, all those titles deserve to win the Newbery. They're all incredible books and they all set standards. But what standards do they set? Um, why are these the stories that get to set our standards? Um, who holds the power? Where is the privilege in children's books? So we're gonna try to open the door a little bit. And um, I have some questions <laughs> for our panelists. I'm gonna kind of direct questions to one person or the other, but I hope that we can jump in. And I'm <clears throat> uh, leaving time to bring in questions from the, uh, from the audience too. So do think about questions as you have them. Um, you know, I, I think, We've got to hear a little bit from um, Jacqueline about your uh, your process of becoming a writer and and uh, and uh, reading your uh, book. If you've all read Brown Girl Dreaming, that um, comes out as well. And uh, I would just heard a little bit from you about how and why you um, wrote Puffy. Um, but I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more from each of you and from Melinda, maybe we'll start with, and maybe we'll start with you about um, your path to children's or YA publishing. I think all three of you, I think, have all been writers all your lives. Um, so was this a path that was always clear to you? Uh, was there anything interesting about getting to your first publication um, that you'd like to share with us? Uh, well, yeah, I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, I remember making up stories with my paternal grandmother when I was really little, like five or six years old. We had a bag of ragdoll teddy bears and we would pull them out. I would sit with her on her bed and we would tell stories about them. Uh, my paternal grandmother was white. Uh, she was one of the few women who lived in China, uh, the People's Republic of China, <laughs> during the Cultural Revolution and uh, I was born there. Uh, we came to the US in 1978 when I was about four. And my grandmother, um, one of the first things she did was write a memoir about her life. So it was published in 1980. It was called In the Eye of the Typhoon. Um, and uh, her name was Ruth Earnshaw Lowe. And because she was one of the first American women to tell this story, it was a major big deal. But she went on a book tour when they had them, you know? She uh, was on like, she was like on CBS and stuff. It was crazy. And I, um, I remember this very vividly because I knew from a very early age, I knew a professional writer. So my grandmother always encouraged me to write. Um, and without her, I would not have written, I would not have continued, you know? And that's why Ash, my first novel, is dedicated to her, even though she passed away before I finished it, so she never was able to read it. Um, but on the other side of the coin, we, we have my grandmother encouraging me, and then we have my parents <laughs> who were, you know, Chinese immigrants <laughs> who were like, you can't be a writer. Literally, they would tell me this, you can't be a writer, that is a stupid idea. I remember having dinner and they'd be like, you can't be a writer, you can't be a writer, you can't be a writer. My whole childhood growing up, you can't be a writer. You have to get a job. Preferably, you should be an engineer. So. Um, when I went to college, I did not major in English or creative writing. I was like, whatever, I can't be a writer. So I majored in economics, and I, um, I love economics. Honestly, it's totally fascinating. I'm, a, I'm completely addicted to that Planet Money podcast. It's super <laughs> fascinating, and it tells you so much about how the world works. I am so grateful that I was an economics major. Uh, however, I didn't really want to be a banker, you know? Like, I interviewed to be a banker. I didn't get the job. When, one of the guys who interviewed me called me up later and was like, I'm sorry, you don't get the job, but good luck in your career as a writer. <laughs> so that was, yeah, I learned a lot from that interview. Um, so it took me a long time to come around to it, you know? I had to try all sorts of other jobs because I grew up thinking, I can't be a writer. And I know a lot of Asian Americans grow up with parents who tell them these things. Like, you can't be creative. You must be a doctor or a lawyer or, okay, an engineer's fine. Maybe computer science is really good, you know? Do that computer stuff. Um, or you could be an astronaut, that's totally fine. But like writer, artist, actor, um, anything that involves creative arts, that, it, a lot of times it's kind of beaten out of you because, not because they don't respect or admire those things. My mother is a professional musician. 
okay? Uh, it's because they, they want you, they know how hard it is in this country to be an immigrant, an Asian immigrant in this country. They, it is a hard job to do. Mm. And they know that you have to make money and you have to be able to pay the rent and buy food. And they don't want you to be wasting your time <laughs> on these pursuits that just do not pay well. I mean, they're, Chinese people are pretty, they're, they're gonna lay it out for you, you know? So it took me a long time to give myself the permission to go for it because my parents had given me so much opportunity um, and had supported my education so much. You know, I, I grew up knowing that I deserved to go to Harvard. <laughs> so it was like, I, I did, I eventually got there. And you know, I, um, I had to show myself that Sure, I could do these things that my, my immigrant parents wanted, but there was still room for me to follow the path that I truly loved. It just took me a really long time. So, you know, it took me eight years to write my first novel. I, I, there was a long time when I didn't write. I, I wrote in three novels in high school on my own. They never saw the light of day, but then I had took a long break when I tried to not be a writer, and it was really not right for me. So my path to becoming a novelist was actually, it took me 35 years, you know? And um, now that I'm, I'm there and doing this, I never want to stop, <laughs> ever. I mean, I, if, I, will I will never stop. It doesn't matter what the publishing industry does to me. I will continue <laughs> to write books. <laughs> Can you tell us about getting your first novel published? Uh, Ash was really a fairy tale experience for me. Uh, because it is a fairy tale retelling. It's a retelling of Cinderella uh, with a lesbian twist. And um, I actually did not think it was going to sell. I, th I thought it was like a ludicrous, crazy idea because I'd never read a book like that. So I was like, where is this coming from? This is really not a good idea. But ultimately, I did it. And I, I found an agent in my first batch of submissions. Um, I'm still with her. And um, we sold it within two weeks of her sending it out. We had five offers from publishers, and it went, I, I, it was really astonishing. I did not realize how rare that was at the time. But you know, reality slowly started to seep in, so. <laughs> <laughs> I or Jackie, do you wanna jump in a little? Yeah, um, yeah I guess I can just say uh, my path, um, my path to sort of writing books has been a path of um, distraction and capacity development. I started out really interested in writing books in my 20s, and I just didn't have the attention span and the capacity to kind of sit in the solitude with myself and by myself to write. And so I got really distracted by more interactive and extroverted forms like spoken word and hip hop theater and slam, which were all awesome, you know, and really enjoyable in themselves and great. Um, ways to create and you know I was able to sort of develop my voice in terms of social commentary <laughs> and with poetry I really learned how to um, you know write word by word and really think about every word and the music and the imagery um, but it's really only in my 40s that I've come back around to fully have the attention span to apply myself to writing, which is really good because as a mom, you cannot waste one second. You have to really be able to get in there and focus and write. So that's been a little bit of... Um, my path back to writing, I think about writing books as being sort of a sit down writer, which is much more compatible with parenting than say, the more performative stuff, which is happening at night and nightclubs and touring. So um, I feel like I've had a few different lives as a writer. Um, so, you know, similar to Melinda, I came out of a family that was not very supportive about um, the arts in that way. And the same thing, I mean, my family migrated from the South, and as part of that great migration, you were going to come to this new country and you were going to make something of yourself. And so the North was that new country. So um, they, they discouraged it. At the same time, I was being taken to the library once a week and made to read and always um, 
made to sit for many hours to study for you know as an academic and also as a witness we had to spend lots of hours studying the watchtower and the wake in the bible so that we could we would know what we were talking about. Um, and you spent lots of hours being bored. And I think those, those are all the tools for being a writer. So, <laughs> so, so there, there was, again, that mixed message of don't do this, here's how you do it. Um, <laughs> And then when I was in, I was in college and I took a, someone recommended a writing class at the new school and it was a writing class with a woman named Bonnie Gable. And I went into it, I think it was in my junior year and it was, um, you know, E.L. Konigsberg would sit in on it, Judy Bloom, like Emmy Kerr. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, it was such a jackpot of a class because it was just every writer I had read as a kid coming through there. And um, I met a woman named B.B. Willoughby when my teacher read a part of Last Summer with me and who said, I want to buy this. Um, and so she bought it for Bantam Double Day Dell, which became Random House, and then she promptly quit. I, I, I like to think it was because she saw what a mess it was, and she's like, I'm out of here. And so then it sat on the shelf for a while, and then Wendy Lamb pick it up, picked it up, and Wendy Lamb was my editor for many, many, many years. And, and that was kind of the beginning, and I know that, too, um, it was during a time, so it was in the 80s and the early 90s, where the door was open. Mm -hmm. So they realized that um, there was not a lot of diversity in children's books and that, were, that we needed to refresh the pool that had been Virginia Hamilton and Walter D. Myers and the McKissicks and a lot of the, uh, and um, John Steptoe, you know, so all of the older writers were getting older and, and so that's the door I came in. And I feel like that's kind of trying to happen again. I feel like that door is open and that because of the dialogues that are being had and, um, and the realization that there is, um, there is not a lot of books out there, that there's not enough, there is not enough out there. Yeah, that's, a, I'm gonna, uh, change the next question to talk more about publishing then um, as well, how we get uh, those voices in the door and some of the um, barriers and challenges that may stay in the stand in the way because of the expectations um, of the or the status quo of the publishing industry. And uh, Laura, I'm going to um, maybe we can start with you. I mean, you've you uh, talked in a, a speech you gave about. Um, working with a Native American author on a book and that you called fantasy. And they had to explain to you that this was not actually, what, what you read as fantasy was not actually fantasy. Um, uh, I had an experience of, um, I don't remember where I was reading off this a review of a book where I said, oh, the pacing of the narrative is all off. Because it goes on, it's like it's too too long, or it's like it which was supposed to end here, and someone had to point out to me that well, this was um, I was expecting to hear things that happen in threes, and that comes out of European folklore, and what I was reading was something where the story happens in four, um, which is uh, just comes out of a, a different culture, and actually the pacing was perfect, mm -hmm. but it wasn't to my ear just because I didn't I didn't realize that I uh, that this wasn't a universal um, do you want to use that as a jump off Laura to talk about I mean what are the are there um, are there expectations that we have for children's literature that are based in a culture of white privilege that might be <laughs> preventing authors getting in the door Yes. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I think on so many different levels. I mean, I guess in my learning curve on this was, first of all, just as an individual, right? And working as an editor, and I didn't go to editor school, or, you know, I started working, and that's how I learned. Um, and even learning at Children's Book Press, which was a nonprofit, multicultural, bilingual picture book publisher, that was really the remit. It was mission driven, um, which I think is how all publishers really should be. Um, but, yeah, I have my own bias and experience and what feels natural and comfortable to me, and I felt like it took quite a few years of working at multicultural publishers where this is what we were supposed to be thinking about, and it isn't necessarily that overtly even part of the dialogue. Um, and I think the more that publishers function within a kind of more mainstream environment or the society within which we live, 
um, that kind of self-reflection doesn't necessarily happen. And, and what my experience was is that if you're thinking about a market and if you're thinking about profit when you're publishing, um, that sometimes a sort of lowest common denominator thinking can come into play too about what's publishable and what isn't. Um, I've written in a couple of different essays but about a book, Deshaun Days, that I worked on where there was a mention of crack vials in it. And um, at the time there was discomfort, oh well, you know, librarians in Texas or Kansas won't buy a picture book if it has crack files in it. Um, and the discussion sort of with the author was, well, for some kids, this is just part of their life. It's reality. So I think that question of who's being seen as an insider, whose story is being told, and how the market is perceived, all of these things are so shaping of the stories, and, and then also really who tells them and who they're telling them to. Um, I mean, it just, right, we, publishing doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it, it re represents a world that Jacqueline was talking about, about people living in all of these different experiences, and it tends to be white, privileged, dominated, the narratives that we get, what you watch TV, what you see in advertisements, everything around, and it's very, very difficult to see that if you're not living this existence where you're having to, you know, see or speak in, in different ways, and I think, I don't see very many publishers doing real work, I would say, on this issue. I just don't think it's a priority. And We Need Diverse Books is getting noise and it's attention, but I think until really deep, uncomfortable this conversation start happening, I don't think it's going to change. Yeah. So Sorry. just to um, jump in there a minute, you know, I, I think publishers do have a mission, and the mission is to make money. You know, and so um, I, I think you know, economics is what's going to change the conversation. I think it's hard to separate the fact that publishers are big business, and I think that's why um, what you were saying about, uh, about self-publishing is, I, I think that's important, the, the, you know, what speaks is the pocketbook, the wallet. So what is, the, how does the, how do we get the message? Because we try to diversify publishing, right? But um, the truth is publishing doesn't always pay a lot, and so the people who are coming into it are coming from some means so that they can have these low-paying jobs. So, um, so they're not coming from the same experience as someone who can um, be more diverse in some ways. You know, I know there are people of all races who have um, privilege, but in that case, it seems the pe a lot of the people who are attracted to publishing are not necessarily people of color. So, so, um, but the question is, what's the? How, how do we create change within when the change is not conducive to what they want, which is to make money? So, I, and, and that's what I, um, I'm not sure how, it, because what needs to happen is that more people need to demand, like, I'm not, this is not a book I'm gonna buy, you know what? And, and you know, I do it, I, 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 I do the same thing. You know, I have two brown kids, and, and every day it's a decision. Every eight, from what they watch to um, what they read to, um, you know, what movies we pay to see on Christmas. I remember, you know, it's like, we're gonna see Selma and Annie, and that's it, you know? Um, and, and, you know, because I, I finally got sick and tired of them having all these windows and no mirrors. And, um, and, I, and I also saw the impact that it had on them, but it is, you know, I'll walk into a bookstore and I'll try to find that book that's by a person of color um, with characters of color in it. Um, and that, you know, that's me doing my part, but I think that demand that has to be, we have to show that demand through saying, you know what, I'm stepping back from this. I'll, I'll go buy 10 copies of the crossover and, you know, give it to everybody because this is, I, I, want, I want to put my money where my mouth is and create change that way. Yeah. I think that also we need to, um, well, I don't know how this is going to happen because I feel like big publishing is so big and it, it moves so slowly and people like us and the We Need Diverse Books maybe can get there, but we have no access to their sales and marketing mm -hmm. teams. And I, I feel like um, there's like, I feel like there's a lack of engagement on the part of big publishing with the actual people who live in the world. Like there's... There's a market out there, okay? You know, 
having worked at After Ellen, there are millions of queer women out there who really want to watch Orange is the New Black or read what, you know what I mean? Like, they are out there. They're just underserved. So they're not waiting in line at Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. because they don't think there's going to be anything there for them anyway. So what are they going to do with you know, waiting there, you know? So there, there has to be an effort on the mm -hmm. part of big publishing to reach out to the people who exist. And I am um, hopeful that the movement, which has coalesced so much around social media and we need diverse books, I really hope that there can be some kind of outreach or effort to make the business look at the actual market. Mm -hmm. One of the things um, that I would say to sort of jump in is there's there's a piece to self-publishing that's a little bit double-edged, right? Because part of what self-publishing then does is self-publishing becomes the market research mm -hmm. that the big five publishers don't want to do. So they allow the writers on their own dime to go out there and hustle and try their books to make it happen. And then when those self-publishing numbers get to a certain point and there's a certain amount of momentum, then publishers can say, ooh, let's talk because you've actually done all the work and now we can just put you on our conveyor belt to mass produce you. So that's one of the things that's, um, and self-publishing offers opportunities to people who would never even be able to get into that position, right? So it, um, it is double-edged in that way. And I think, um, you know, the big, for me, one of the things that's interesting to watch shifting has to do with this notion of, of mirrors, because communities, marginalized communities around race, sexuality, gender, class, nation, we've always been hungry for those mirrors. But part of what has to shift in order for things to shift more deeply is for mainstream readers to not just be interested in the window like, ooh, what's happening in, you know, Tanzania right now, but sort of the notion that I can identify with this protagonist, mm -hmm. that I, as sort of a white middle class girl in Wyoming, can look at this girl of color or, um, you know, or uh, a marginalized person and see myself and really identify. And it's been interesting having a five-year-old seeing like the white girl come to preschool in her Dora pajamas, you know, and the, the white boy in the Doc McStuffins lunchbox, mm -hmm. that there's something that's starting to shift a little. And I think, you know, having a black president has really shifted something in the consciousness it has for anyone who is laboring under the 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 delusion that it's fixed everything it has not but um and i don't think you're in this room but many have that delusion but there's something about leadership and role modeling that is shifting mm -hmm. because there is a way that we're starting to see more stories, both in our actual national leadership in uh, film and television, of people of color as leaders and central. And so it's gonna take a while for that to really kind of shift into the kinds of books that folks can see. And then there's also, the other thing I'll just say in publishing is sort of the fake diversity, right? So um, my daughter is now interested Every librarian will know this and perhaps grown the Rainbow Magic series, right? Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. the fairies, right? There's like hundreds and hundreds of these books, <laughs> ghost written. Like there's a there's like a cave of writers that ghost write these books all day long. There are just hundreds of them, and you know they have different color fairies, right? So you look at them. So I was I was introduced to them. We're of course at the library. And it's story time, and my daughter's like, oh, look, fairy books. So there's like a hundred of them. So I'm like desperately going through and like weeding out the white ones and finding all the brown ones. Yes, we can take 20 of these home. They're all like brown fairies. There were a hundred books. And, um, and yet, even though we have brown and Asian and black fairies on the cover, the, the, the core of the story is about two white girls in a white town, mm -hmm. you know? And the fairy narrative is all European mythologically inspired. So it's, 
the other thing that's important about diverse books is how diverse is it, right? Is it, are we talking about skin deep or are we talking about that we're really having an alternative perspective, that there's a depth of difference, that it's speaking to marginalized communities, and that, I think, is also needs to be part of the story as well. So and the other part where the, the money circles back around is not just within the publishing, it's, I'm also hearing it among the, uh, the authors, uh, you know, whether your family raises you to believe that writing is a viable profession or whether you have to Indiegogo your own books into production. Um, uh, but there's also many issues on the side of who's, um, if we talk about creating a demand for these books, who are the gatekeepers for that demand? Booksellers, librarians, teachers, um, and that those are all professions that don't pay. <laughs> librarians were getting uh, probably paid the best of them, but th those are also professions somewhat of privilege. Either they really pay nothing, they re or they require a master's degree, um, and when we look at reviews, which create some of that demand, the uh, uh, reviewing does not pay. I mean, the the, um, the the there are some the Horn Book and Kirkus will have staff writers, and you get kind of a a pittance that doesn't. It's not really uh, an hourly wage even to have written the review. SLJ, uh, which is really the main place for children's book reviews, it's, it produces the most children's book reviews, um, depends on volunteers, many of who are probably in this room. You guys get a copy of the book, right? Um, so who has the ability and privilege to write these reviews, and then what do we see reflected in these re reviews? You know, and, and there are many issues that these reviews have gotten shorter and shorter and shorter over the years, and we all kind of have our shorthand and lingo for what, how we talk about them, and how, then how do we talk about um, diversity and culture in these reviews? Who is, how can we, um, how can we, uh, as reviewers, um, when we're talking about who is the reader for this book, how can we make room for the girl from Wyoming to, um, you know, to show that she really, uh, she's the reader for How It Went Down by Kekla Magoon. I mean, um, and Melinda, I was really intrigued by your perspective on reviews in your blog because coming to them from a writer's perspective and not a reviewer's perspective, um, and maybe you can just share a, a little bit about some of the things that you've noticed in reviews. Sure, well for Diversity NYA, we do these lists of new releases every week, uh, the new diverse books that are coming out every week. And by diverse books at Diversity NYA, we only talk about books in which the main character is a person of color, LGBTQ or disabled. Um, so, so I'm sorry, your gay best friend doesn't count. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we, in order to post these these lists of books, I read reviews of them because I'm constantly trying to figure out if a book has diverse content. And honestly, a lot of the time, the book cover obscures it. So I have to read the reviews. And so I just go and read the trade reviews. And over the past several years as I do this, I've noticed a lot of things pop up that are just kind of like, huh, yeah. Like, they, they, they reveal a certain uh, perspective, a certain privileged, white-centered uh, pers perspective on the part of the reviewer um, when they um, situate this book there in the, in the trade review journal. So um, I did a really long post <laughs> on Diversity in YA. I think it's like 6,000 words. So <laughs> it's really long. You know, get some coffee first. Um, <laughs> in which I talk about various issues that arise in the text of these reviews. And it's true that I am a, I'm a novelist now. Um, in the past, I was a reviewer. I mean, I was an entertainment critic. So I've written tons of reviews, you know? And a lot of my reviews probably were horrible. And I, I probably would have, I, as, a, as I started out, you know, you take up reviewing as a freelance writer because that's the job that there is. You know, it doesn't pay well. It pays really crappy. But you have to get your byline out there and get a background. So that is when I was reviewing, when I knew the least about what was going on, you know? Uh, the more experienced you get, the less you do reviews because they don't pay. So you're going to move on to writing features as soon as you can. Um, so writing this post, 
I did draw from my experience as a reviewer, also as an editor. You know, I eventually became an editor of reviews, <laughs> and um, I obviously also write books and have been have received reviews of my books. Um, it's an interesting dilemma because writing book reviews is really hard, especially if you only have like a paragraph to do it in and you have to get across all the salient points, you know, in a clear and concise way. It is really hard. I totally acknowledge that. And uh, that's why for me in this post, it was more about talking about the collective responsibility of the, the trade journal, working with the, editor, with the editor and the reviewer to make sure these books are presented in a way that is fair to the story being told. Um, so the post is really long, so I can't, I can't really yeah. summarize it too much here. I just, I think that it is important. It was basically a, a, an attempt to show how um, unspoken biases are revealed through these book reviews. A lot of times we don't say things out loud about race or um, sexuality that, you know, we might think in our head. But in a review, sometimes people say it. Mm. And, you know, I thank them for saying it because a lot of times people are like, there's no proof that there's racism. Mm -hmm. But look, this, <laughs> this is like, this is institutionalized systemic racism. It is not that the reviewer is a bigot. It's that these are the beliefs that have permeated their consciousness for their entire life and is being revealed unconsciously in a way in these reviews. So, you know, I'm really grateful that these reviews <laughs> exist because it gave me it gave me something to um, look at and examine in a in a not in an impersonal way. I mean, I I never I did not mean it as a personal attack to anyone. It was mm. more of an analysis of what is happening throughout the entire industry. But it, it seems can I just jump yes, in? It please. seems so important to have you write a piece like that because the reviews are out there. They've been out there <laughs> forever, right? And and people are reading them without necessarily thinking critically about them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where this discussion, you know, in terms of critiquing, I mean, it came out also with the Horn book and this question of, of reviewing self-published books or not, and with Roger Sutton saying, oh, well, you know, these days, the industry, there's not really that need for self-publishing because anything's publishable, pretty much, <laughs> which I would disagree with. Um, I think it's so important to think about, and as librarians and the review sources that you have, you have a lot of power in your low-paid, <laughs> you know, honorable work, but to be providing access to books that maybe aren't coming out of the big publishers that have all of the promotion and the um, kind of emphasis that there are people who are needing to do this and bringing in perspectives that wouldn't necessarily make it through. Um, so I think that's a powerful position. Do you want to share share anything about your experience as you know uh, a consultant with uh, with smaller or starting publishers and reviews and Yeah, I mean like? I'm so excited. I think for me, part of why I left publishing is I mean I'm a radical left coast Berkeley girl. Like I think the publishing industry was hard for me as a person working within it. And I am loving being in San Francisco and surrounded by some of the people in this room who are doing, I think, publishing books that wouldn't get through. Janine Macbeth over there who runs Blood Orange Press, her book, Oh, Oh, Baby Boy has, which is a beautiful book. <laughs> 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 but it's got a birth canal spread that I don't think the mainstream publishers would be comfortable with. Um, you know, Zed Elliott is sitting back there who's created an incredible self-published book. Um, you know, is, is, has got a picture book coming out about lynching, you know, or, or looking at incarceration or issues that, you know, Jacqueline's gotten, you've gotten them, some of these things into your books, but it is not easy. And when you get it in, how you position it, um, I'm not sure if Kate Schatz is here, she was going to come, who's um, Back there. written, there she is, <laughs> written Rad American Women A to, A to Z, which has sold out of its first two print runs as it's just come out. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, but... And that's, that's City Lights publisher. So it is a publisher, but it's San Francisco based. It's their first children's books. And how many books do you have? They're gonna have A's for Angela Davis as the first person that they say. Uh. So I think this is where, to me, the, the hope, personally, I've, I'm kind of fed up with the mainstream publishing industry. I just, I, I don't wanna be there myself. So I am very grateful to be in a place and find that there's this world of people creating books that I think would not pass through the kind of gatekeeping structures that are there. And I think, yeah, there's a question of money. There's a question of market. There's a question of how do you get an audience. But I, I guess I, I want to be idealistic and think people doing it for themselves. People are starting to do it. And I think there's, like I said, so much power in librarians to get these books to kids that are going to mean so much to them um, in that mirror sense. So yeah, that's what I'd say. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, on um, just uh, on an even more basic level, though, in talking about um, the presentation of books, I've so often, and I don't know um, how other people feel about this, but there's so often when I think about the qualifiers and the qualifiers through a mainstream gaze so that, you know, when a book of mine is presented, this book is about a little black boy who blah, blah, where is it, if it's a book that's not a person of color or not a queer kid or, you know, it's always just that. So here's, this book is about a boy or this book is about a girl. And so those qualifiers, you know, automatically take something out of the mainstream and also shift the gaze. So um, I, I think in terms of presentation, at what point, what information needs to be said? Um, that's, I was in a bookstore in my neighborhood and it was great because there was this, um, this uh, Orthodox Jewish family had come in and the boy, um, the 12 year old boy had just read the crossover and was looking for something else. And, and um, you know, the mother kept saying, well, are there other books about those kind of boys, those is like, okay, well, you can say black boys in this situation. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, someone had put that book in his hand and said, he, he said, I asked him, you know, how did you, how did you get that book? And he said, it's a, someone told me it was a book about basketball. And, and, you know, and I loved it. And I thought, okay, I want to meet this librarian who was able to see this six foot tall, 12 year old boy, you know, with the yarmulke and the curls and, and say, okay, here's a book you would love about basketball. And I think that doesn't always happen that way. And the qualifiers are hard because I feel like this is this is what shut down the conversation um, for in the 90s was the sense that we're not we're, we're past this and we don't need to call out the books we've got Jacqueline Woodson and we've got Rita Williams Garcia you know uh, <laughs> it's, <all> <laughs> <me>. <laughs> we're all it's done. a wrap it's done <laughs> all right <laughs> and. But we need to know, as the selectors for materials, if we need those materials, we need to know which ones they are. And I, I feel like as a, you know, as a reviewer and someone who reads reviews, I, I just feel like okay, we're not there yet. We thought we were there, but we have to. Someday we'll be able to stop qualifying people within reviews, but. For now, uh, we have to correct an imbalance, and so we have to call it out. But the imbalance, is the, but then how come it's not called out for white folks? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, that's the other thing. I, I, I'm perfectly fine with it, but I never hear someone say, this book is about a white boy, unless it's a person of color, you know, <laughs> talking about the book, because we always talk about race, but, but I don't see it done in reviews that way. Yeah, I think yeah. it's the things we don't see, right? Like with Maya Gonzalez back there and her latest book, which has got a gender neutral child in it, and you wrote in the Huffington Post about how reviewers, you know, you can start to see what comes through, what assumptions people make, but it's often hard to see unless it's something that is right in your face, mm -hmm. right? That's why reviews are great, because they have to write it down. <laughs> so when we get to the action part of the day, we might start talking about whether ACL as an organization wants to consider our style guide and how we call out these things within reviews. I want to start taking some questions from the floor without, um, because I have more questions, but I'm sure you guys too do too, and maybe Meredith will pass the mic. I'm assuming there's some questions. There's one all the way in the, the back corner, Meredith. Um, for it. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, this question is really part comment, and it's also for the librarians. Um, I'm mostly an adult services librarian, though I'm doing a lot of children's now, and I'm finding this throughout. If I do a display that has a black person or a person who looks Hispanic, or Chinese on the cover, it's really hard to hand sell it to, for somebody to take that book out. And I want to ask how it is that, I guess I'm asking it of the librarian, how it is that white librarians sell books that are not um, about white people. Because I live in a neighborhood that's very white, um, I live in a neighborhood of people who read, highly educated, and I don't see my colleagues necessarily handing out that book that has the Asian kid on the cover or that's about an Hispanic person or that's about a black person the way I hand out books about white people. 
So I, as a follow up, this is my question: Is are you are you talking about hand selling to the parents or hand selling to, parents, to the kids? To kids, to somebody walking right by. I find that okay when it's Black History Month. We put out the Black History books. When it's um, Hispanic American Month, we put out the, and it's Chinese New Year, we put out the, but how about we put out the good books? How about we put out the one that was so funny? Or we put out the, how, how are we doing that that includes people who are not, who are not white? How are we doing that? Hmm. And I'm asking the librarian, but yeah. anybody well, that's me, and I, you know, other people in the um, oh, in the audience here. may have thoughts too. I mean, my I, I asked the question back because in in my experience, I think that kids are more receptive than the adults are, and so um, I think that uh, I think having what what you've just alluded to, having the books out all the time, um, and um, and creating a, a displays that speak to actual interests of kids, um, creating displays throughout your library. And, and really, uh, well, and the other thing is you have to have the books. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to buy them, and you have to um, have them in volume so that the books that you face out in your library, which you, you know hopefully do throughout your library, because that's how kids take them, mm -hmm. um, are balanced, and you have to put, actually spend a lot of time um, just uh, merchandising your books in the library in a way that we're not um, we're not always used to. I think also in um, libraries that we need to depend more on our all our entire staff, our volunteers who are hanging out in the library because. Um, Kids don't always want to take a book from an an adult. Can you can your teen volunteers make a book display? It's probably more likely that uh, that kids and teens will take books from that display. And who who are the trusted people in your library who can hand sell books to uh, to kids in your library? Um, I would just add. We've talked a little bit about this notion of white privilege, but there's just another word that seems like it's the moment to bring out in the room, and that's just the, the language of white supremacy. So part of what we're looking at in terms of books is the presumption that books about white people are books by and about white people are better, more interesting, that those characters are more universal, and that everybody is interested in their lives. And, and part of what we're actually bumping into is actual racism, you know, because part of what racism says is that the lives of people of color and queer folks and folks with disabilities, they're just not very interesting. They don't think very good thoughts, you know, unless they've proven that they're extra funny or have, you know, won a gold medal in the Olympics or something, then that, you know, well, then that person is exceptional, but really the av your average people in those communities, we don't care about their lives. I mean, that's the whole conversation, black lives matter, that our lives matter and then our stories also matter. And so that's sort of part of what we're up against. And I think um, the notion of creating demand and resisting that, like librarians are actually being specifically put in a position where you can either go with the flow which is that everybody's gonna be attracted to the covers with the images of the people who look the way that they've been taught you're supposed to look to look interesting, or you're going to actively resist and interrupt that narrative of white supremacy. And so, um, and it's a big job. And it's not just publishers and librarians' fault. Because I think for publishers, publishers know that that racism is out there. And they're like, well, you know, my job is to sell as many as I can, right? And so clearly, if I have, you know, white celebrity so and so on the cover, I don't have to worry about it because that brand is already established and will sell itself. But if I have an unknown person of color, then, you know, I have to fight for it. And it's really just about deciding to fight. And I think that the, yeah, I think that the fake diversity, the fake diversity that you alluded to is especially insidious in this way too, right. because, um, you, you know, do, uh, sure, I would, I'd love to, I, I think it's important to have all the brown rainbow fairies out there to get, just so that kids can have them and to 
get a uh, community who's not used to picking up books with colored people on the cover used to it. Mm -hmm. But if that's what's getting published and written, the uh, the lives and stories are not actually getting published and right. written, and um, and where how do we create the demand and the door for that? I know there was another question over here, and yeah, yeah. I think Meredith has the mic for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'll be very brief. So I'm coming from the perspective of being a former bookseller. So it's about handing um, the book out to the readers and making people interested in reading out of their comfort zone. So, but what I wanted to encourage all, um, I love librarians, that's why I'm here. <laughs> because I sneak my way into, into here. But I just... <laughs> There's no sneaking. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think one of the ways to um, be able to give those books with people of color on the cover to, let's say, a white population, uh, start to the grassroots movement. I just want to encourage you to not be discouraged. And all those little steps that you're taking, they really count and they make a difference. So one of the things I, I, I want to add is diversify your sources. You cannot just rely on the publishers, um, what is it called? The, the booklets, they're going to recommend, of course, the, the books that they publish and the ones they believe in, but the world has changed so quickly and it's, it's still happening, you know. Um, there are such a diverse source of just way to put books out there. We talk about self-publishing, there are smaller publishers and all that, and I know you only have such a limited time, um, but I just want to encourage you to diversify where you're looking for those books. So one of the ways, I'm thinking of Tanita Davis, and we met at a former conference. She has put on, um, taken on the task to go through as many self-published books she, she books she can to just um, pick out the ones she considers the best, not based on her own reading, but she's like going through so many um, blogs out there and putting a database and hoping to just share it with whoever's interesting. So interested. I live in Davis, um, California, and the library over there reached out to me to help them also um, just not just recommend books, but help them build a database of, of those books that won't be labeled as this is a book for black people, this is a book for Asian and things like that, but just as action section, adventures, you know, things like that, but make sure that those sections, those categories are diversified. But what I'm really trying to say is start with all of you just in just changing your habits. It's mm -hmm. normal to, to stick with what you know. You've been trained a certain way, but just also, um, sorry, because English is a bit sometimes, mm. my, my brain is really weird. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to, to encourage you to, um, to ch change your habit. It's really, it starts with you. So yeah, yeah that's why. Thank you. And it's, it's, it, um, talk about insidious when you talk about needing to make, uh, go out and look in other places for books, what's happening in libraries right now, it has to do with money. Um, they streamline the collect the selection and collection development so that usually that's filtered through one person. You can we can only use the major vendors. It has to happen lightning fast. It's all based on reviews, and we're doing that in order to be able to spend more time on the floor with the public. But um, but I think we have to recognize that part of part of that rich work that we need to do with the public needs to go back, and we need to all the time we're saving through centralized collection development, we need to spend some more time seeking out the books that we're not getting that way. And I think we have time for one more question. Yep, yeah. I know, In, unless we wanna go over time. But. Um, yeah. well, this is partly a comment, but I'm, I'm curious to what the panel has to say about it too. Um, I do collection management for Oakland Public Library and I've seen some of the same thing happen where we get the books that are harder to hand sell that have diverse characters. But um, what I've noticed is, and I think, I, I suspect this is a tendency of the big publishers is to um, kind of funnel authors of color, illustrators of color into very serious um, issue-based books. Um, and those books, yeah, they're, they're a little bit difficult to get kids interested in. But all over Oakland, I'm finding when we have books that are fun, that are cheerful, that have smiling kids on the cover that are people of color, we cannot keep them on the shelf. I have all my selectors come to me and say, these books are completely gone. They are gone all the time. I had three copies of Puffy at my last library, which was in a primarily African-American neighborhood. Every time I turned them face out, they were gone immediately. Mm. They just 
because they're they're cheerful kids. And I maybe some of you can comment on whether that's something that that happens in publishing and how we can work on that. Yeah. Merit, right yeah. there in the red shirt. Well, it's just where the publishers aren't putting out anything but those serious books, I feel like. Fantasy is, is a huge place where I've had trouble finding diverse books. Yeah, I mean, actually, Zed and I, on the way over, were talking about this, the kind of shifts that have happened and that you were talking about, for, like, at Children's Book Press in 1975, it was folklore. That was kind of the gateway of, like, okay, this is how we're going to bring in diversity, and that happened for a while. And then it sort of shifted, and it became only realistic stories and no folk tales. But I think that is really where the next shift needs to be, is entertaining books, but not just, like, that you were saying with the fairies that are kind of whitewashed, but... You know, that there's a c authenticity and specificity to the stories, but that, yeah, they're, and that they're not just Western fairy tale. Um, yeah. I think there is fantasy out there. I think it's harder to find, but with the internet, it is way easier. So I really encourage you to check out diversityyna.com. We have a lot of book lists there. Um, there are a number of fantasy book lists, I think, because Cindy and I are both Asians who wrote fantasy and science fiction. So we, we love fantasy and science fiction, and we try to feature those books as much as we can. I know that there are book lists. I don't know if We Need Diverse Books has book lists. Do they? Um, they have a book list, but I don't know if it's yeah. um, genre specific. Yeah, so it, it, there are lists online. Um, it, it does require some legwork on your part. Um, I think that it is true that a lot of books about minorities are often presented as serious issue books, and I think there, that is for a number of reasons, partly because of white supremacy, <laughs> um, because there is some, seems to be some belief that minorities can only have serious lives. Um, and also, I think that there is a tendency for these books to be serious because it is the serious books who win the awards. Mm. And for a writer who is struggling to get a story published about a diverse cast, you know, if they know that it's going to be a hard sell. At least you could win some awards because that, like, will mm. keep that, it in print for a while. That'll keep it in print for a while. So there are a lot of ish factors at work here. So I think one way to get more um, diverse genre fiction is for um, awards to recognize them. And I, I think mm -hmm. that would be wonderful because I think there's so much wonderful fantasy and science fiction being published. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it is just relegated to like the bestseller lists, except the diverse, diverse ones don't really get there. So, uh, you know. I, I was going to say, and I think that it's a balancing act, right? Because on the one hand, you know, part of dealing with systematic racism, um, homophobia and heterosexism and transphobia, ableism is to deal with the oppression. So you don't want books that are like, tra-la-la, I'm just going through the world all is well, right? Because that there's something that's missing there. There are times to celebrate, though. So you really want, um, we would want a spectrum within communities of books that are light and cheerful and books that also speak to the struggle, but we don't want that kind of everything to be so grim. Um, and I also think that there's a larger there's a larger way that people of color from those different communities are supposedly our only expertise is on our community, right? So recently there was this conversation about how the majority, I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna paraphrase it kind of so-so, but the majority of uh, Latinos or Latinas who were quoted in the media was only on issues of immigration reform. So the hashtag ask me mas was like, oh, I actually great. know about other things. Right? So <laughs> some Latina writers started this hashtag because they were like, actually. So I think you know that's part of it too. I love that idea of the book about basketball, right? Like the. Um, that we, that we could be writing about other things. And it's hard, because you don't want to be like, oh, I just happen to be black, or I just happen to be Latina, but that it's all happening simultaneously, and the focus doesn't have to be on the grimness of racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's do one more question. 
Thankfully, it's not a question. It's just a comment that I want to kind of draw our attention to for a moment. And that's that I'm still really hearing a lot of white focus. So we're talking about diversity, but it's like, how do we sell these books to white kids, to white families? And what, how does this markability work in the white culture and da-da-da and the status quo and breaking things down? So just for a moment, I want to notice that we're still really positioning ourselves facing white. Thank you, Maya. Um, we could do this all day, <laughs> but we want to continue the discussion um, after lunch in a few different ways. And I want to make sure that you guys all have time to spend time with uh, our authors and to buy their books, which is an action that you're going to take today. <laughs> and to close up the panel, I'm going to ask each of the panelists just to say really briefly, I, this is. I, I think one of the hardest, thing for, hardest things for us in this room is we keep on kind of getting this discussion started and we get a little bit farther each time and then our time runs out. So we're going to try to spend some more time today on this and, and we're going to end with uh, some action items to continue the discussion. But how do we keep this discussion from fizzling out again? What is, if you have one, one thing you want to ask the participants in this room to think about or to do, uh, what would you ask them? I think I'd probably mirror what Natalie said about um, being maybe more open and creative about finding books as librarians. Um, I think that would be it. I think that's what I would say too. You know, there are a lot of resources online, and I feel like I'm, I'm, I mean, diversity in is just my thing. So, <laughs> but I do think we've put a lot of work in there to put together lists of books for you to look at. So please go online. Please look. So if you don't, it, just because you can't find something off the top of your head does not mean it doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah, diversityNYA.com. <laughs> and and uh, we have a bibliography can, um, also that you're going you go to get access to as part of, uh, part of today. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, the biggest thing that I would say to everybody is that this is a really, really long struggle. Um, and to be committed for life, um, to have the optimism that we can end racism in our lifetime, but also understand uh, that we need to stay connected to each other and keep fighting not to be discouraged, and to also understand that what we're battling for at the level of books and stories is really about what we want in terms of justice for the larger world. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yay, justice. Justice, no peace. Um, I was just thinking the hashtag, how can I shift? Mm -hmm. I think this is so much about shifting perspective. Um, you know, I can't come back to the qualifiers enough. I'm so mm -hmm. done with those qualifiers. Um, I, I think the thing, whenever I turn into a book to my editor after I've rewritten it like 20 times and I'm like, Nancy, this book is finally <laughs> finished, she reads it and she says, this is a great beginning. <laughs> so that's what I think about today. I think it's a great beginning. <laughs> Never ending. Thank you.